everybody welcome back to chapter three the south seas part two moki and mit arrow are both small coral coral islands of the true sense simply columns of coral that have built up out of the sea and over the centuries become islands neither is very high above sea level so both are very susceptible to hurricane damage High stormy seas could wash right over these islands. One thing I remember about these islands is their thick skinned oranges and also lots of wild pigeons flying about. Artu Island was another of these small atolls, but it looks like somewhat larger than the other two. At Artu we often picked up islanders who wanted to go to work on the so called manure island islands such as Malden, Starbuck and Nauru Islands. We visited these manure islands later on our route. It was actually claimed in the New Zealand Parliament that ships were engaging in blackbirding. This blackbirding is a fancy name for kidnapping islanders and selling them off as slave labour. Some other ships may have well have been engaged in such activities. As for us, I remember one incident when the resident commissioner of Artu, I think his name was Mr. Nigel, forbid the native people there to accompany us to the Manure Islands. Native people approached our captain on the sly and arranged for us to meet them at a certain point. Sure enough, they were there waiting impatiently. They came aboard secretly and we took them to where they wanted to go. So much for Countess being in engaged in blackbirding, at least while I was aboard her. One of the, my favourite islands was Atutaki. It was from there the majority of Countess's grow came. Atutaki was a large, low island, although it does not rise to higher ground towards its back although it does rise to higher ground towards its back sorry once again we lay out beyond a coral reef in this case we usually put our kedge anchor on the reef and set a small sail so as to lay off the island we held off by the gentle offshore breeze Atutaki was inside this big was inside this was inside this reef, a big wide lagoon that's full of shallows. Atatakians hunted for sharks which lurked in this lagoon. Some people native to the island caught these sharks by diving down and putting a lasso around the shark's tail, surely a dangerous way to get one's food. Admittedly, when in their lazier mood, these people caught their sharks by spearing off fishing line by spear off fishing line. Ah, I guess that's the, the Hawaiian sling, is that what it's called? Yeah. The sharks that were caught were fairly divided amongst everyone who wanted some. The Atatakians also caught conga eels with their bare hands. On certain nights of the year, a little fish came here to the surround to s surface in hundreds. The people native to the island knew of this certain night and were all prepared for this night. They had coconut leaves bound up together to be used as flaming torches and the people caught the little fish in dip nets. On other nights, if the mood moved them, the people of the island took their torches and waded in the shadows spearing fish. Another trick used for one fish was that together with a usual hanging type of net, they also used another net that floated on the surface. These particular fish would see and jump to vertical hanging net and land in the land in the craftily placed horizontal one. Island people also caught a tiny red fish, which they would fill it and eat raw. The fish tasted good when eaten raw, I found. I was always careful to only eat the fish that the native people said were safe to eat. Some fish looked as though they would be potentially a delicious meal. In actual fact, the flesh of these fish was highly poisonous. 
One also had to be extremely careful about picking up shellfish. Some beautiful looking shellfish had an extremely poisonous barb that when stuck into anyone foolish enough to touch them. I was a keen shell collector and brought home many shells for friends and relations. But as with fish, I would only touch these things as safe by native people. Once I found some large sea snails and asked the captain if they were edible. He said yes, but to only eat the part which he showed me. This piece looked like the best part to me, like a thick piece of custard. I ate some, but was soon glad I didn't eat much because I felt squirmy for a couple of days after. Turtles fairly abounded at Ataki. Native people followed the turtles followed the turtles marks left in the sand to find and dig up these turtle eggs which were round and springy like ping pong ball which were round and springy like a ping pong ball. I made a habit of trying all the local dishes regardless of what they might be. Luckily most pro 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 Proved pleasant enough, but occasionally one strikes what is downright vile, a downright vile concoction. Turtle, to my mind, is one of the most absolute ultimates in delicious food. Of all the dishes I have ever tried, turtle must surely rank as the foremost. Native people spear or catch the turtle by hand, then simply flip the turtle upside down on an open fire. When cooked, the meat is pure white fat or green colour, Ty, an, an islander friend of mine, asked if I would like to catch a turtle. I certainly would. I had some hand-woven sandals, such as native people wear, to protect my feet from the razor-sharp coral. Wearing these sandals, we set off wading through the shallows. Islanders out on the reef were rounding up turtles and driving them inshore. One of these turtles, of about two feet in width, swam close to us. Ty yelled for me to spear it, and spear it I did. Later I went to the trouble of cutting around its shell as to get it undamaged back, as to get it undamaged back, hump-like shell. The islander's method of cooking the turtle whole open an, over an open fire ruins this back shell. I took this shell back to Auckland and later gave it away. We on board the ship enjoyed magnificent turtle soup for days after that hunt of mine. To be asked as special guest of honour to the feast of a chief was to be, uh, to be asked as special guest of honour to a feast the chief was given for me was a great honour. We went into the long hut and all sat down on woven banana leaf mat. The chief and I at the head of this mat and the others of the village sitting away down on either side of us. Those of the highest ranks sitting next to us, then lesser ranks until women and children who sat at the other end of the mat. Women opened the hungi and laid the food before us. Kumra, taro, yam, conger eel with sauce made from flaked coconut mixed with coconut milk, chilies and salt water, turtle, shark, and many other fish, also shellfish, sea snails, and sea slugs. Fruit included bananas, oranges, mango, breadfruit, and plantain, plus many other fruits I couldn't recognise. The chief and I ate first, selecting what we wanted from what laid before us. Also, according to island hospitality, any food that was presented to me on the banana leaf, I was obliged to eat or to take it away with me. But the last thing I wanted to do was offend these fine people. Thus I went away fairly loaded down with these gifts. When the chief and I had finished eating, the lesser ranks ate in their turns, with the women and children eating last. Besides, this was their general merriment, during which I got up and danced also. My, my effort must have looked like some sort of cross between a waltz and a highland fling with a bit of hula thrown in. Some of the people tried to imitate my dance with varying degrees of success. The audience being reduced to a helpless state of laughter at these dances and my antics. This whole island feast proved to me to be a truly memorable experience. I seldom left Atutake without some tail feathers from the balsam bird 
These long bright red feathers were used a lot for decorative work. I thought perhaps one or two of these might give my dull black engineer's hat a bit of a brighter flare. All of the islands we visited, of all of the islands we visited, Penryn Island, P-E-N-R-H-Y-N -E Island was probably the most dangerous to approach. Penryn is actually a number of islands set in a coral reef. To get into the island's safe anchorage, we had to run the gauntlet of other islands. These other islands were actually hundreds of separate columns of coral projections from the seabed. Many of them were up to 15 feet in diameter and to complicate matters, most stopped short just below the surface. Our captain had to climb up the masthead from where we could see these death traps and direct our helmsman to steer between them. We arrived, we visited Penryn on almost every trip around the islands, yet without doubt one of my most memorable trips there was during my third or fourth voyage on the Countess. On that trip we had a passenger, Miss Beatrice Grimshaw, who was already a famous Australian author. I understood her to be compiling material for a book set on the islands. While at Penryn, Miss Grimshaw had the most anxious to see some pearl diving. Was the most anxious to see some pearl diving. There were definitely some pearls on Penryn, as one of our Atatakian crewmen, a native called Nio, N-I-O, had big front teeth, and I believe Nio means teeth in the islands. He had brought up a perfectly shaped pearl that measured almost half an inch in diameter. He received £80 for this pearl, and I believe this pearl was sent to Europe where it fetched £1,000 for its sale. Someone found a diving suit, and I volunteered to take the plunge wearing it. This outlandish outfit consisted of a large, round brass goldfish bowl-like helmet, and huge heavy lead boots. This canvas suit itself only re reached down my waist like an outsized canvas jumper. I struggled into the cold clingy canvas jumper which tied down at my waist. For the lower part of my body I just had on a pair of old dungarees. Then I sat on the edge of the dinghy while my willing helping hands strapped on the heavy boots. These were so heavy I had to sweat and strain to merely Move them an inch or two. Next the helmet was lowered over my head and fitted into place. Once this was on, I had to sit completely upright. If I leaned forward, this weightly helmet would have toppled me right over. Finally, a stout rope was tied under my armpits. This rope to lower me into the depths with and haul me up again. A couple of the native people began winding handles on an antique air pump. Cold, rubbery, smelling air flowed down into down a certainly no very inspiring looking decrepit patched air hose that stretched between the pump and my helmet, joining us like an umbilical cord. There was no valves, radio telephones or other fancy gadgets to muck about with or worry about. Simply a matter of slipping over the side and committing oneself to the deep. Some chap who talked as if he knew something about this business told me not to worry about the thousands of bubbles that would come floating up before my eyes. As the theory was, the air forced down into the helmet would come out of the bottom of the suit. If I was being attacked by sharks, and there was plenty of sharks about, we could see their fins slicing through the water, all I had to do was lift up the bottom of my suit and the sudden extra burst of bubbles would scare the sharks off, providing I saw the attacking shark through my bubble screen in time to take the appropriate action. The problem of not being able to see the shark had a ready answer. When I felt the shark bite, then I take the precautions, again being bitten the second time. I couldn't help noticing my good advice giver was extremely reluctant to take my place. By the looks of the expressions on all the bystanders, every one of them would be pleasantly surprised to see me hauled up alive at the end of the 10 minute dip. 
Suddenly a look of horror crossed everyone's faces. Something was going on behind me. With my head encased in the helmet, I couldn't turn around or hear what was going on outside. Just the steady puff, puff, puff of air. Next instant, someone snatched at my helmet. I pitched backwards and my helmet must have connected with some metal object. A mighty clang which all but knocked me out and stayed ringing in my ears for hours. By the time I had recovered from the shock, my helmet and suit was being stripped off me. Mr Nigel, the resident commissioner of Penryn Island, was standing there. He told me in coarse blunt words that he absolutely forbid this escape to go, escapade to go on. He said that there were dozens of shark, barracuda, conger eels and worst of all gropa abounding in these waters. He ordered the people to take the diving suit to where it could be put under lock and key. Thus my first and last deep sea diving attempt came to an inglorious conclusion. When thinking back on this incident, I realised that perhaps I have a lot to thank Mr Nagel for. Anyway, apparently Ms Grimshaw got sufficient material for her book because years later I heard a radio serial the storyline of which sounded familiar. I checked up and found this serial was adapted from Miss Grimshaw's novel. Perhaps it was pure coincidence that this supposedly fictitious story was so closely resembled fact and its hero was the splitting image of me. At Penryn I saw a classic example of just what a conger eel is capable of if a person make a mistake while barehanded fishing for the eel. In this case, the person had made a slip and the eel actually twisted and wrenched the entire muscle off this man's arm. Ugh. Another native had his whole thumb torn off. I saw, this, I saw these disfigurements. He, as did other people who barehanded fish for eels, accepted losing a thumb or more as simply a hazard of the game. Fred Kench owned a store on Penryn Island. One trip he asked me to bring him back a suit of clothes. When I asked what his measurement said, he said the same as I. Indeed, when I tried on a suit of Fred's clothes, I found they fitted me like a glove. Next time I was in Auckland, I had a suit made up for Fred and took it back to him. The suit couldn't have fitted him better. I wondered why such an obviously as educated a fellow of Fred as Fred was tucked away on an out-of-the-way island. Fred told me that for years he had rooms in the Metropolitan Hotel in Auckland and had been a bookkeeper for a gang of racehorse owners and trainers who were rigging races. Ooh, something went astray with their crooked deal and the authorities began nosing around. Fred discreetly moved off to Penryn Island and settled down to run, him, run, run his small, quiet, legitimate business. And I'll just leave it at that and I'll read part three of chapter three very soon.